Fights in Tight Spaces takes the deck building formula in an interesting direction. Its basic structure is a strategy game heavily reminiscent of Into the Breach, where manipulating the positions of both yourself and your enemies is absolutely critical, and every turn is an intricate clockwork puzzle of overlapping attacks you have to somehow weave through. And into this strategy title, Fights in Tight Spaces inserts a deck building system that leans less heavily on prearranged deck archetypes and focuses more on making each card an individually interesting tool. It's a design ethos that's only possible because the game leans so heavily on its strategy gameplay, which means that the title could both appeal to someone new or not as interested in pure deck builders, and might tempt longtime deck building fans with something a little bit different from what they're used to. As always, I'm Alex, and this is First Five, where I ask if games are worth your time, not your money. I played a game for five hours, and I'm gonna tell you if those were five hours well spent. And today, we're strategically dismantling some crime syndicates in Fights in Tight Spaces. Before we get too deep into the review, I did receive a free review copy of this game, so heads up. Fights in Tight Spaces cites John Wick Hex as its biggest inspiration, and there's a lot that they have in common, but the game that's an even closer fit is Into the Breach, so if you've played either of those touchstones, you know what you're getting into, and if you enjoyed either one of them, I can already tell you that this game's probably worth a shot. For those who haven't played them, however, here's the basics. Whereas a lot of deck builders abstract their combat purely into a card game, Fights in Tight Spaces is a capital S strategy game first. You're still playing cards, but you're doing so on a full-on game board, and most of the cards involve either moving yourself, your enemies, or both around. Much like Into the Breach, a lot of the game is about managing spacing and manipulating the battlefield. Every enemy telegraphs their moves ahead of time, and much like Into the Breach, every turn becomes a puzzle of how to survive long enough to make it to the next turn by weaving between all of those attacks. You can even pit enemies against each other if you're savvy enough and have them all knock each other out without even lifting a finger. Fights in Tight Spaces might borrow pretty heavily from Into the Breach, but it's almost as tightly woven, and the idea works just as well here. Throw in environmental kills you can pull off with the right tactics, side objectives that force you to play risky, and a lot of abilities that require specific spacing, and you've got a pretty compelling foundation for a strategy game. And slathered on top of that bedrock are the deck building bits, which don't feature quite as prominently as in most deck builders and probably aren't what to come to the game for, but still fill their supporting role competently. Using Monster Train that I covered recently as an example, that game has five different factions with half a dozen ways you can play each. Fights in Tight Spaces, meanwhile, has a single character. Don't get me wrong, you can build your deck any number of ways. You can build defensively around cards that counter enemy attacks, build a really mobile deck where you can zip all over the place, even build a really aggressive deck that's all about momentum and building your combo meter. But no matter how you build your deck, you are always Super Spy McPunch Fist, with the same list of cards to draw from. This is compounded a bit by the fact that most of the more interesting cards don't seem to show up until you make it further into a run, as well as the fact that there's a benefit to taking just about everything, which means that every deck, even one that you're trying to fit into a particular archetype, is going to look a little similar, as opposed to another deck builder where a poison deck or an armor deck will share like two cards, and if you get fatigued playing one character or faction, you just swap to a different one for a bit. Fights in Tight Spaces isn't built around these different archetypes like most deck builders are. Instead, it's all about the individual cards, many of which are hella cool on their own without having two other cards to bounce off of. Like, there's this one card that does a disgusting amount of damage, but requires you to position yourself with a wall to your back. Or one deck I made that was built around this flying double kick card that does a lot of damage, but has to be used from a tile away. And so my entire deck was designed to manipulate enemies into my ideal range, usually by knocking them away, then following up with one of those flying kicks to finish them off. More than trying to build a poison deck out of the six cards that fit the archetype, Fights in Tight Spaces is about finding these individual cards that excite you and figuring out the best way to make them work. And overall, that's a bit of a departure from what most deck builder fans are probably used to, something that shifts a bit closer to a more standard roguelike experience, but I think it works. This is mostly because the strategy half of the game is already compelling on its own, and the deck building elements are just there to support it and force you into unique situations by never quite giving you an identical kit each run. But I think it's also a valid way to design a deck builder, with a hundred interlocking tiny pieces instead of seven different big ones. The one thing I don't particularly like, however, is how damn long a run is. Just through sheer numbers, Fights in Tight Spaces is pretty epically long, whether you judge it by a deck builder's standards or a strategy titles, featuring five different levels you're supposed to roll through, all with what feels like 15 fights each. I couldn't give you an exact estimate since I haven't completed a run yet, but it feels like it's gonna run you at least a solid four hours to make it all the way through a single attempt, and it's a bit of an endurance trial, I'm not gonna lie. And here again, that slog isn't made any breezier by the fact that most early game decks start looking pretty similar 
Smuggler and you won't start seeing many of the game's most interesting or powerful cards until you make it halfway through. I haven't even gotten to touch many of this game's coolest toys, because whenever they pop up, they're just not compatible with what I already spent two hours building. The game even seems to be aware of the fact that individual runs have a habit of overstaying their welcome since it lets you start midway through a run, but doing so means skipping out on any rewards from earlier levels without a downgrade in difficulty, so it feels like a bad idea to actually take the game up on that offer. Going back to one of the game's core inspirations, Into the Breach, I'd rather have a similar setup where I can tackle the game's various gangs in any order I want, and each gets more threatening based on how many I've already beaten. And you know, while we're at it, I also wouldn't mind if each gang got trimmed down by like, just 20%. But while I'm already on the topic, we should wrap this up and ask, what do you get out of five hours with fights in tight spaces? And while this game might not have a hundred hour long ladder with 25 rungs of difficulty modifiers to climb like ye classic deck builder, seeing the end credits might still end up a hefty time commitment just through the sheer amount of time a single run takes. But in the case of this game, as with many roguelikes, the journey is far more important than the destination, and so regardless of progress, five hours is a perfectly reasonable amount of time to put into this one. It's enough to see what the game's about and get a fulfilling experience, but there's still plenty more to explore and dig into if you really fall in love with it. There's also something to be said about the fact that this game is still in early access, and while I doubt they'll be making it much longer, there's always the possibility of added content coming in at a later date, say, maybe another character class or something. And they have said that they want to add additional cards that might add some variety to the game. Overall, Fights in Tight Spaces does enough to differentiate itself from other deck builders, both in the sense that if you're a fan of the genre, there's something new here you'll appreciate, and in the sense that if you're not, there's still a lot you'll enjoy outside the card slinging. It's a tightly woven strategy game that owes a lot to games that have come before, but it still does fantastic work at making all the ideas it's inherited its own. It's only Achilles' heel is that it is both longer than most deck builders and features less variety, which might not be huge problems in isolation, but compound each other when put together. It's probably not a must play in the grand scheme of things, but if you're looking for a new deck builder, roguelike, or strategy game to dig into, it's still a solid choice you won't regret. And if you enjoyed this review as much as I liked Fights in Tight Spaces, consider supporting me on Patreon. With your generous support, I can start doing all kinds of cool stuff like more in-depth video essays and five-hour streams where I review games like this in real time. So if any of that sounds cool, please consider becoming a patron today. But I hope you enjoyed this first five review. Thanks for watching this far, and I'll see you all next week.